on there, Big Ray. There we go. Good to see you tonight. Great to have you in the Lord's house. Sounds like we're going to get some storms here in a little bit. I hear thunder. I see lightning. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have some stuff going on here tonight. So glad you're with us. Stan, if you will, we'll open with a word of prayer before we sing our scripture song and then a couple of hymns. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a precious time it is for us to be in your house tonight. We thank you for uh, the storms that are headed our way. I pray that, Lord, they would uh, bring some much-needed rain and cooler temperatures. I pray that it, it would uh, uh, be a safe type of storm, Lord, that wouldn't have uh, any, any problems with people navigating uh, with that. I just pray that you'd allow others to come in this evening um, to your services. I pray for those who have joined with us today here. Uh, and uh, who are with us online, that you just bless us as we dive into your word, as we sing and lift our, our voices and praise to you, and as we pray, and Father, lift those things on our heart to you uh, to, to receive your answers. We ask for all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Page number 701 in your hymnals, if you'd like to use them, our scripture song is from Psalm 46.1, God is my refuge, page 701, if you'd like to use your hymnals. Tune. Page number 408, How Firm a Foundation. We'll sing all four stanzas. Page 408. Shall not. 
found in the old hymnal, so you're not going to have it there in front of you, but the words will be up on the screen. It's one we haven't sang in a long time. I shall not be moved. So that means you're not going to move, right? Don't change pews tonight. Right? Here we go. Page 40. Got it. Jesus is my Savior, I shall not be moved. In his love and favor, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. In my Christ abiding, I shall not be moved. In his love I'm hiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. If I trust him ever, I shall not be moved. He will fail me never. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. On his word I'm feeding, I shall not be moved. He's the one that's leading, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Lord, I shall not be moved. Good singing. You may be seated. Thank you, Miss Tamara. Appreciate that great playing. And let me grab my prayer list over here. Uh, do we have, we do, yes. And so the teens and the, um, the juniors can go and head on back to class. Emily, make sure they learn something back there while you're there, okay? All right. And we're going to take some prayer requests here uh, in, in the services tonight. So if you got, how many of you did not get your prayer request list? Do you need one? Brother Rick has one. Okay, anybody else need one? No? Okay, remember to pray for these things here on the front of the prayer list under immediate needs that are highlighted. Uh, of course, our troops on the border, I, I noticed today that they were saying this is like a 25% uptick in, in, um, in folks coming across, and there's some concern, cons people coming across that are a little bit concerning uh, on some of the list of, of folks that... Um, on the terrorist trail, so we want to be careful with that. Uh, so pray for them, for their safety, and that they would be able to protect our borders. Also, if you would pray for uh, the continued um, work that's being done to try to clear the way for the folks to purchase the property here, the south end of of, uh, of our property, in the in the near in the near weeks or months. And also pray for Miss D's health, uh, doctor's appointments, and physical therapy that she has coming up. Pray for Miss Bonnie Villarreal as she continues her radiation treatments. Um, and for the hunters, uh, the plumbing and, and uh, repairs to their kitchen and, and their home so that they'd be able to get back in. And uh, uh, that would be an amazing thing. Also pray for Ava and Aiden. They'll be traveling back this week for Bruce Derrick for his uh, leukemia. Brother Doug had put him on the list. Uh, for Miss Bobby's recovery from her recent procedure on her neck. Also for Kelly's recovery from her knee, procedure on her knee, for Margot for this numbness that she's experiencing, uh, for little Theodore who uh, a couple weeks ago at his, at his um, aunt's wedding uh, fractured his little leg again, and so they've got him back in the boot, or they're trying to keep him in the boot, I should say. 
He likes to wiggle out of it as much as he can. Also for uh, Pat Depper, uh, for heart issues. Did I say that right, Tom? Dupree? Is Dupree? Depair? Depair. It's not spelled right? Okay. 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 Um, also, if you pray for, so, if you pray for Lily and Donovan for um, her blood clot, and she also has an unspoken request for Diana Campbell for cancer tests and salvation, and uh, um, I don't know what that has at the end of that. A one A I A A L A L Al. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a, and for Al, okay. Uh, Al, I, I'll put that on there. So, um, any update on that? Okay. Okay. Continue to keep her in prayer. Hopefully, hit a good result soon. Hopefully, uh, pray also for Christine for recovery. For Stephen uh, D, who's in the hospital. For Dora uh, H, who needs grace and the peace of God. For Jamie D, uh, Leon, mission trip to Africa. Uh, Mikhail Etheridge, uh, who's in critical condition. Um, we, Brother Don had mentioned this one. Also, and that's from uh, the Vortex drilling here, one of his young, um, like a son to him. So I don't, haven't got an update since last Wednesday night on that. But for the Alvidrez family, as they're um, traveling up to Missouri this, this week, also for Doug Castle, uh, he's going to be having a platelet-rich plasma injection in his lower back on Friday, and so he's praying that that would go well and his recovery, recovery time would be um, quick and that the procedure would work and give him some relief. He also had a couple of other uh, additions that he wanted us to put on our list tonight, and that's for Aaron and, and Jesse and the, and, the baby and, the, and the kids as they head out on Saturday to head towards Virginia to their next assignment. It's been a blessing having them here for the kids for the last three weeks and have um, <clears throat> Aaron and Jesse here uh, just the last week or so, but uh, pray that they'd have a, a safe transition up and, and, uh, and a good, good, uh, good uh, uh, way of getting, getting in there and getting established there. Also, uh, for pra uh, praise for Melissa Glover, she is actually in outpatient care ahead of what, what they thought was gonna, she was going to be in. Um, her blood numbers are still a little bit wildly fluctuating, Doug says. Um, he'll get more, sh more information out to Sister Sherry here soon, and she'll put it out to us quick. So those are some things that he wanted us to pray for. And also remember Jessica Nino and her family for comfort. Um, don't forget to play for, pray for our government, our church's specific needs, our college students, even in the summer, summertime. Uh, and then there's a lot of folks on our church family needs that are, that are highlighted, Sister Hazel, for her health and strength, and for uh, Bennett Beulah and the kids that they'd get here at the end of the, uh, this month, I think, actually, and the 15th, so it should be here soon, and it'd uh, be good to see them, celebrate with them again back in the States. Also for Brother Martin uh, Hendricks, um, that he'd recover from this latest episode that he had, uh, of, of, get a little bit, a little bit too hot, because you could, so you could ask Stephen next time you, just, uh, the next time you see him, you say, Brother, I heard you were really hot, you know, so. He'll, he'll get the joke, he'll get it, but uh, a little bit of heat stroke there, so uh, pray for him that he have good recovery. Again, Sister, Sister Bobby uh, and Brother Jim with his, uh, his health, his hip and appointments. Pray for the Normans, for their health, from Sister Audrey, who is uh, going in for this surgery also to help prayerfully finally be the answer that give her relief from these migraines that she's suffered with for so many, many years. So pray for her uh, and that. Uh, also for Tamara, uh, uh, Tamara and uh, her blood platelets. On the back side of the, of the health care, or the, um, the prayer request list, um, there are a few that are, are highlighted for Melissa Glover, her cancer treatments, side effects. Uh, we, we just had an update on her. It was a good, good report, but still some fluctuations there. Also for uh, Linda and the recovery or the healing from this leg injury that she had, and for Sandy Berean's sister, uh, who's in fifth stage dementia. So. Anything else that you would like to add to the prayer list, or do you have praises that you would like to uh, add tonight to our list? Anything at all you would like to add before we go to Lord in Prayer? Anyone? They don't cost anything. 
No? All right. Then we'll go to the Lord of Prayer. We'll, we'll, uh, you'll hear uh, the music play, and, and then when you hear... Um, I can't... Sweet, it's not Sweet Hour of Prayer anymore. It's Lord's, the, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which are... Yeah. When you hear that on the harp, um, it'll give you about another three minutes of prayer time before we, we start the message. So... Uh, we'll go to the Lord individually, or if you want to pair up in groups and that, you may do that too, uh, and offer these things up to the Lord. All right?
if you would please, this, this evening we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 1, primarily 2 Kings chapter 1 is where we're going to uh, take this evening's message from. Um, it's interesting, I was, as I was doing my, my daily Bible reading um, here in the last few weeks, I was going through the books of Kings and, and Chronicles, and that's where I was focused on, and some of the Psalms, and, and uh, one, one passage just kind of struck me. It struck me as odd, it struck me as interesting, because I see so much parallels in today in society and in, in man, and I thought, well, how, how appropriate is that? You know, the same things uh, occurred thousands of years ago to people, and, and we, we're still making some of the same dumb mistakes. Um, I make some of the same dumb mistakes that, that my predecessors have, and, and, you know, we're supposed to learn. We're supposed to learn from history, are we not? So that we don't repeat the bad things, and we do repeat the good things. That's really the, the, the crux of what, we're gonna, uh, what we should do. But uh, as I was reading through this passage of Scripture and, and the account here, I, I realized, you know, how often it is that people, including myself, uh, when something major happens to us in life, when there's a major event, something that sometimes is unexpected, sometimes can be expected, um, we don't immediately, 100% of the time, go to the Lord for answers. We turn to whatever else it is that we trust in. Maybe that's our bank account. Maybe that's our car. Maybe that's our friends. Maybe that's our own selfish abilities. But we don't always go to the one and only God of the universe and ask for help there, ask for wisdom there, ask for guidance there. Because, you know, we so often, even in small decisions, we just we become capable of making them, or we think we do, by ourselves. And we're going to see that here tonight. And, and that's what I want to explore tonight. I would imagine uh, it, that if, if not everyone that's here tonight and everyone that's joined with us online, um, if not a few, but probably everyone has at least in, once in their life encountered somebody who was considered, or at least I should say considered themselves the most... important person or knowledgeable person in the room, the smartest person in the room. And just ask them, they'll tell you, right? Right? Have you never had somebody like that? I've personally served under commanders and senior non-commissioned officers who honestly thought nobody else could outthink them, could outperform them in anything in life. And it was to their hazard because oftentimes – they made the biggest faux pas or the biggest flaw of falls of them all because they wouldn't listen to people around them. They wouldn't go to trusted leaders, trusted advisors, trusted people who cared about their leadership and um, wanted to just get them, get them the help that they needed. And so the, to, tonight we're going we're gonna to focus here. Before we actually dive into the scriptures, I'd like to pray one more time just quickly uh, that the Lord would be... Um, be in the midst of us in our, our meeting tonight and help me to stay clear in mind, clear in conscious, and, and get these things uh, conveyed in the best way possible. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, the insight that you've shared with me over the last several days as I've been studying through scripture. And I pray that I'd be able to, with, with some ability, be able to, uh, Lord, convey this message as it was conveyed to me uh, to, to our dear people. And that we'd be able to glean some truth that might help us to avoid the traps and the snares that so often are in front of us because of our own, uh, our own selfish um, understanding of, of being able to take care of problems our own uh, rather than falling on our knees before you. Pray you'd help us tonight, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us focused, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so if, if you want to back up just for a second, Philip, for, to, to one spot, go back to um, uh, First Kings. First Kings, and uh, chapter 
Uh, what's the last chapter there? Just back up one chapter. 22? 21? 22. Verse 40. Verse 40. And in, in, first, in first Kings verse 40, we, we learn that there, uh, it says, and they continue with him, 22, 1 Kings 22, 40. So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah, the man we're going to be studying at night, Ahaziah, his son reigned in his stead. Now, we know who Ahab was, right? What a, what a rosy character he was, huh? I mean, what a lovable big fuzzball of a guy, right? Don't you? And his wife, she was just as dear to the people as he was. I mean, what a lady. Woo, Jezebel, goodness me. That couple had some issues, I'll tell you what. And um, Elijah, he took them to task over and over again by God's direction. And you would have thought that that family, now again, you know, sometimes as I'm reading through these Old Testament scriptures, I think, well, who are these people? And then I have to stop and remember, these are God's people. These are Israelites. These are the 12 tribes. It's their inheritance. It's their lineage that's making all these dumb mistakes, turning to all these false gods. And you think, what is going on here? This is crazy. But in chapter 22, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 40, we find that um, Ahab dies, and now his son, Ahaziah, is taking over the throne. Now, we're going to find in just these next few verses of the next chapter how long he actually serves as king. It's not a long time because uh, something, something kind of interesting happens to him. Um, if you look at the Bible, it's filled with examples of people who are overtly or overly, I should say, confident in their own importance. Uh, it's true that most people in this category uh, find at least one time in their life when, uh, when God grabs a hold of them and just shakes them so hard that it puts them back in their place. But some of them never do. Some of them never wake up from the fact of thinking they're the best thing on earth, that they are God's gift to everything and everybody. And that is so sad. It, it's really a problem that goes back. It's as old as sin itself. Um, people think that they can do things without, without God in the middle of it. Or they think they can outthink God, or they can figure things out without God. We saw it in the garden with Adam and Eve. Um, they chose to defy the clear direction of God, the God that had, had, had told them exactly what he wanted them to do and not to do. And although they walked with him daily, they communicated with him intimately. They were sinless. They chose not to follow his direction. Um, what a tragedy that then was inflicted upon mankind, that tragedy called sin, because they failed to follow his direction, and they believed the lies of Satan. And he is the father of lies. We see it in their son's lives. We see it where, where Cain felt slighted, and he took, he took matters in his own hands. And what did he do? He took his brother's life. Could you imagine the first man and woman have two children, one of their children uh, kills the other one because he's jealous? What a, what, a, what a script. What a tragedy. There's a trail of men and women in Scripture that have taken on the mantle of this, this uh, thought. Um, and far fewer are those who are meek and who are lowly and who hold fast to a perspective that guarantees success because they follow and they look to guidance from God, our Heavenly Father. Now, there are some notable examples of people who do. You think of people like Joseph. He followed the Lord. He lived a life that was righteous. He fled from a, a, a temptations and that. And he loved, even in, in, in difficult times, Joshua. You look, look at David. Look at Daniel. Look at Ruth. Look at Esther. Look at Abigail. I mean, you look at some of these sweetest people in the Bible. They're, not that they didn't have sin. Not that they weren't, didn't have problems of their own. But you see them going to the Lord. You see them going to him more often than not, the true God um, in, in their lives, and finding the direction that they needed much, uh, much of the time of their life. They didn't think themselves higher than the God that created them. I'd like to zoom in tonight on just this one man. Um, who descended from a family that had witnessed God's true power over and over again. 
They had witnessed it up close and personal, but they didn't learn a thing. And we find this account here in, in um, 2 Kings chapter 1. We find that he takes over reigning in, in uh, chapter 22, verse number 40 of 1 Kings. And then if you jump down to verse number 51, sorry, brothers, verse number 51, 20, 1 Kings 22, 51. We see him taking over the kingdom in the 17th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign, uh, who was the king over Judah. Now, now, this king was the king over Israel, the other ten tribes, the northern tribes. Uh, during a time when there was really a relative peace in the land, there was communication between the kingdoms, there was mutual support. But nonetheless, this king, who had every opportunity to, to do things in, in, a right, in a righteous way, uh, stepped right into the same shoes that his, fa- his parents filled. Um, and he chose to follow Baal. Look at verses uh, 52 and 53, and, and you would see that. Now jump over to, to chapter to chapter twenty or to uh, First Kings chapter one, please. Second Kings chapter one, please. At this point, he's what's probably a pretty comfortable life, okay. And in in verse number one, it says, if I can get to it here real quick. And Haziah, wait, 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 verse number one. Go back here. All right. Send me out, boy. There again. Then <laughs> I don't have it on my notes here. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. So after about two years of being on the throne, after the death of Ahab, this king, again in his palace, looking at life as the head of his domain, the ten tribes, okay, he had a pretty, pretty uh, important and prestigious life. And yet, if you think about it, he um, was going to witness some things here just in, in, in pretty, pretty quick in his life that were going to be so traumatic to him that he was going to start making some decisions, and they were all going to be bad, bad decisions. Um, he was in the palace's upper chamber. We see that in verse number 2. And in verse number 2, it says, And Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick, and he sent his messengers and said unto them, Go and inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Wait a minute now. He had fallen now through a a, a lattice in the temple. Um, He injured himself so badly that he worried, was concerned for his life. That tells me even then, even back thousands of years ago, people suffered home injuries more than they suffered injuries anywhere else, right? Because how many of you have fallen off a ladder or done something goofy at home and, and hurt yourself? And you thought, man, shouldn't have done it. Probably didn't listen to old mom, Jezebel. Say, shouting out at him, you know, hey, you know, you know, you better get down off that ladder before you hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. But he didn't listen. We don't know if that's what happened. But something did, and this king falls through the lattice and, uh, and, and injures himself. What's he going to do? This is where I want to focus our, our attention this evening. Let's take a look at his decisions from this point forward, because this is what happens to us oftentimes. Same thing that happened to this guy, to Ahaziah. Something traumatic happens to him, and immediately he turns to the source of what he thinks is going to be the answer. But his source is wrong. His source is messed up. How many times have I done that in life? I'm not going to ask you how many times you've done that, but but I've done it in times where where something has happened, and it's like, oh, well, I've got to figure out a way to do, and, and I'm looking for the way to do it. Instead of just saying, I know who knows the way. I just got to get wisdom from God, from the true God of heaven. And if I do that, I'd be successful in it because he would point me in the right direction. But look what Ahaziah does here. He turns to first, he turns to the wrong advisors to get answers. He turns to the wrong crowd. Um, He immediately directs his messengers to seek out the Lord. 
uh, uh, to seek out the Lord of the Flies, that's Beelzebub, okay, to see if he's going to recover from his injury. Look at verse number two. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice. Okay, we already got that upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent his messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Now keep in mind, he descends from a line that traces its roots back to the one true God that brought them through the, through the, the Red Sea, that got them out of Egypt, that, that put them into the promised land. He descends from the same lineage of the same God that did all of that, why is he not going to the true God of Israel? Why is he going to a foreign God, Baalzebub, the Lord of the Flies, for his answers? We don't know. That's what his mom did. That's what his dad did. They didn't go to the one true God either. And look at time and time again in their lives how God disciplined them or showed them uh, the error of their ways. But he didn't lift a finger um, to, 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 to try to find it from the real God. This is when things get real interesting to me. The one true God that's omniscient who decides uh, at this point to say, I see what you're doing. Let me just send my prophet over to give your messengers a little message of your own. And so without the direction of the king... This prophet, Elijah, is told by God, go meet the messengers. Now, I don't know if you, if you've, have you ever been a messenger for somebody important? You ever carry an important message for somebody and they told you to take it right here, right there? Uh, I've done that. We, when I was in the embassy in France working there, uh, when 9-11, when 9 hit, there were times when I had to, to go to the, the French foreign ministry and to their, their offices there and take classified documents and things like that over um, about what we were going to be doing, air operations and all of that. And it was important information that needed to be conveyed. And I knew it was my job to get it there. These messengers had an important message from the king, and they wanted to go get, they wanted to go get the prophets of Baal uh, to, to tell them what was going to happen to the king. Look at verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Wow. So the one true God wants to know, Why are you going to some place that doesn't really have a God when you got the real God right here? I don't get it. Now, thus, now therefore, it says in verse 4, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So get the picture here. These messengers are coming from the king, okay? They're going to Beelzebub's prophets, to his priests, and they're going to say, okay, the king wants to know, is it going to recover? Is he going to make it? On the way, Elijah pops up. And he says, oh, by the way, isn't there a God right here in Israel? And, and, and in fact, there is, because let me tell you what he's going to say. He says, your king, he's not getting out from that bed. He's going to die. All right. Uh, so go back and take in that message. Whew. I don't know about you, but... Uh, Elijah gave them the message that God gave to him. Does anyone see a problem with Elijah sending those messengers back to the king? With the king's, in the king's perspective, without them continuing on to their, their, uh, their journey? Because to me, that's the dangerous thing to do. The king says, you go here, and they never got there. And they come back and give the king something completely different. Hmm. Not something I'd want to do, especially with a king like this, descended from parents like he had. Uh, it, it just seems to be a little problematic to me. Uh, he, they didn't make it to Baal's prophets. And the king wants to know why in verse number 5. So look at verse number 5. It says, And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? He couldn't figure it out. I sent you on a message. I sent you on a mission 
and uh, you didn't fulfill the mission. Why are you back so soon? <laughs> and look what they do here in verse number 6 as they lay out the situation for the king. And it says, And they said unto him, There came up a man to meet us and said to us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. Oh, did you think the king wanted to hear that one? That's not the answer that he wanted to hear from the prophets. Do you think that's why he didn't consult the God of Israel? Because he was worried that might be the situation, and he wanted to go to somebody that might give him a different story. You know, there are people that will tell you anything you want to know, anything they think you want to know. And, and um, that's the kind of message he wanted. The king wanted the message brought to him the way he wanted it brought to him from who he wanted. Because he wanted the answer to be what he wanted, not what God wanted. That, again, is one of our problems in life. We want what we want, not necessarily what God wants. And if we could just turn it over to him and say, God, whatever you want, I know it's going to be best for me. And we'd accept that. Think of how much happier our lives would be. God, I want that Maserati. <laughs> well, no, you need a, you need a, you need a, a, a Yugo, you know, one of those prized possessions that, you know, everybody ought to have in their driveway. At least, you know, as an ornament. But God, I really want a Maserati. God knows what we need. And um, if, if, a, if a Yugo would get us there and do the job and maybe save us money, save us time, maybe that's what God wants us to have. Can't you see the king lying there on his bed in pain, wondering who would have had the audacity to hinder his messengers? I think he's, he's got to be, because you know he's there at the palace, surrounded by servants, surrounded by doctors, surrounded by healers, trying to figure out what are we going to do. Reminds me of a story of a king that was, uh, he was a prince actually in Paris. It was one of the princes of Paris back in the, I don't know, 1600s, 1700s. And he was, he was in a jousting competition. And, and they've got a statue of him out in one of the plazas there in the, in the city of Paris, not far from the city center. And, and he's on a horse and... And this prince was in a jousting contest, and, and as he, was, he hit the other opponent, um, and the other opponent's uh, jousting uh, sword, or jousting rod, up pole, or whatever, it just hit him, it shattered, and it shattered, and, it came, and a piece of the pole came up and went into, past his helmet and into his eye, into his brain. It didn't kill him. It didn't kill him. He did not die right away. So what did they do? They'd never encountered that before. This is the prince. They started testing. Well, how could they treat this person by doing the same thing to other people? Just to see, okay, well, break off a jousting pole, jab it in somebody's eye, let's figure, figure out if we can figure out how to make them live. And they killed lots of people trying to, and he finally died. But you think, these people, sometimes, uh, they're just not thinking right. And this guy was not thinking right. He, he, he's trying to figure out how he's going to save his life. And um, he's not even consulting the people who knows when this is, when, how, how it's all going to come on in the end. Um, but I, I think he must have thought the audacity of someone to think they could take my messengers, give them a message I don't want to hear and send them back to me. Who is this person? <laughs> we find out in verse 7. And he said to them, he says unto them in verse 7, What manner of man was this which came up to meet you and told you these words? See, they started to describe the man with only two features out of their mouth. <laughs> the king figured out who it was. Look at verse 8. And they answered him, He was a hairy man. Anybody else in the Bible a hairy man? Esau was a hairy man. John the Baptist was a hairy man, right? These hairy guys, I'll tell you what. Man, there's something about them. Uh, he was a hairy man, and second feature, he was girt of leather about his loins. He had a leather belt on. Hairy man with a leather belt. And look what it says. 
and he said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. He figured it out with just two features. Now, tells me that he already knew some things about Elijah. Maybe when Elijah was up on Mount Carmel and, and, and God fried the, the false prophets, you know, in the big competition there between the prophets with Elijah, uh, maybe he had seen him there. Certainly he had heard of him. Certainly he knew him. But he recognized who it was that had, that had captured the attention of his messengers pretty quickly because he, he, sees, he exclaims it. It's Elijah, the Tishbite, the Tishbite. And then he probably thought in his heart of hearts, oh, man. Because if you look at everything that happened to his family, while well, that one prophet was in, 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 uh, in the God's work there, you'd know that it probably wasn't a happy thing for him. With all that had transpired between the prophet of God, Elijah, and his family prior to this event, there was no doubt um, who was at work here. See, we're at a critical juncture now in this, in this situation. Uh, the king can either continue on his own path, uh, knowing that he's still the smartest person in the room, or he can fall before the face of a god uh, who is supremely in control of all of heaven and earth. Unfortunately, we know the rest of the story, don't we? He continues along the same path. He wants what he wants, and he's going to get what he wants. At least he thinks so at this point. So what's he do? Secondly, this is what he does. He flaunts his power, and he assembles a captain and 50 soldiers and, and demands they fetch the prophet so that he can show him what happens to those who might thwart the king's will. And in verse number 9 it says, the king, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on top of a hill. I, I wonder if it was Carmel again. I mean, it's a great place for a fire, right? It's a great place for a little bit of time alone and, and reflection. And that, been there many times, I don't know, it doesn't say what the hill was. But uh, this captain comes up, and he's got his 50 soldiers behind him. I don't know who picked this guy, but think about it. He comes up, here's Elijah up on, the, up on this hill, up on this mountain, and as he comes up, I'm sure he thought, buddy, um, you're coming with me. King sent me to get you, you're coming with me. Because that's what soldiers do, right? Go do, and they go do. Typically. And so he spake unto him, look what he says. Thou man of God, the king hath said, come down. Well, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Pretty easy to understand, pretty easy to comprehend. I wonder in what tone he told the prophet that. Because the answer that he got from the prophet is pretty telling. Um... Look at what it says here. Elijah calmly responds to the captain, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. As those words were still ringing in their ears, fire fell from heaven and it took the lives of every one of those soldiers, every single one of them. And they were gone. I bet it didn't take long for that news to get back to the king. Because what, we, what do we see? How is he going to respond? What's he going to do? Well, well, sure enough, he is the son of Ahab, right? He's the son of, he, 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 he's the, son of the king. He's going to put another, another entourage of soldiers together. Another, another captain, another 50. Let's try this again. First time didn't work. Don't you get three tries in baseball before you're out? Isn't that how that works? And he was just a chip off the old block, wasn't he? I mean, he was daddy's little guy. Um, he went right back at him again, verse number 11. Again, also he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, look at this guy. Thus hath the king said, come down. But he didn't just stop there. He added another word. Quickly. You better make haste, buddy. King wants to see you. Get your stuff together. We're going. Now, <laughs> what did King do uh, at this point? Think about this. The same result immediately 
Bam! The Lord sends fire from heaven and kills the captain, kills his 50 soldiers. Now the king's down 102 men, two captains, and, 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 and 100 NCOs. Bam! They're gone. Just like that. And so would you think the king would say, eh, probably time to change strategies just a little bit. But does he? No. No, you got it. He sent, a third, he sent a third company with another captain with the same message. And, and, and you, don't you wonder, how do they go about selecting these guys? How would you, if you were in that army, feel? Oh, hey, 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 uh, hey you know what? Whose turn is it next? <laughs> yeah. No, I got leave. No, I, I, I'll take that TD, TDY to, to, to wherever, Egypt. It's interesting that this captain sported a completely different attitude than the first two when he approached the prophet. Look at verse 13. And he said again, a captain, and he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of the 50 went up, and look what he did. And he came and he fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. This captain humbled himself. He recognized Elijah's status as a man of God. He prayed that he would spare his life and the lives of the men with him. He also acknowledged God's power that God had demonstrated on the first two companies that were sent. You know, we often hear folks say that all life is precious in God's sight. I believe that that's what this captain was trying to note when he wrapped up this plea to, to, uh, to the king, to, uh, to uh, uh, Elijah. And it's at this point in this, in this account that God intervenes again. He intervened the first time to tell Elijah what to do, to go to the messengers. This time, he sent the message to Elijah through an angel. And in verse 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, with that captain. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. I'll bet the mood in the castle that day was a little bit tense, just to say the least. Think about it. Here we have a young king who's only been on the throne for two years, who's facing an uprising from Moab, we saw that in verse number one, and who has suffered a grave injury and has just suffered the loss of 120, 102 members of his military. One would wonder if Elijah wouldn't maybe tiptoe in and deliver a you know, nice, easy message and try to bring some comfort to this ailing king. <laughs> nope. That's not what he does. Look at verse 16. I love the scripture because it just shows him what he's going to do. It says, And he said unto him, For thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Same message that he gave to the first messengers that came. Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. He lets him know that because he's turned to a false god, he was going to suffer an untimely death, and that nothing was going to change that. And that's exactly what happens in the very next verse of this portion of Scripture. If you look at chapter 1, verse number 17, it says, So he died. According to the word of the Lord, which Eliza has spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, excuse me, in the second year, uh, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. So Ahaziah reigned for two short years. He repeated the sins of his forefathers. And rather than learning from their mistakes, turning back to God, um, he thought he knew better. He thought he could figure out a better plan. And like his father, he suffered the consequences. 
He lost the kingdom. He lost his life. You know, folks, there's so many, t- there's so many people today uh, that are on the same kind of path. They, they're on a path to where, hey, I, I've got it all figured out. I know what I need to do. And they don't consult God. We are in dangerous territory when we don't consult the Heavenly Father. Even in the small things, we consider the small things. Because, you know, it's the, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It really is. It starts with something little. I had a, a great pastor one time say, you know, um, was my, my son, uh, Matthew, our, our son, he could be a little bit of a challenge as a little guy. And our pastor uh, at the time in Spain said, um, you're going to have to be careful because uh, with your children, oftentimes the sin that you excuse in moderation, they will do to excess. The little things that you excuse in the home, they will do them to excess in their homes. It builds upon it. So you need to be really, really careful what you allow them to do. And, um, and sometimes that's, that's where we get in our biggest trouble. We, we, don't, we don't look to God for our answers. And when we don't look to him for our answers, the true God, we look to others. We look to our own means. We put ourselves up for an, uh, an opportunity to fail in, in, grand, in grand fashion. I like what Matthew Henry said in his commentary. He, he said, uh, as I was studying this passage there, it's better to learn from the fire of God than suffer the fires of hell. I mean, that's, that's just, it's so there. God wants us to have a pure life. We're refined by fire oftentimes. He takes us through hard times Oftentimes, I believe, for, for us to turn to him because we, he can save people from the fire. He's shown that over and over again. But he can also take people with fire. And we saw that tonight. Um, if we would just learn, the principal application is that when, when trouble sometimes come uh, and important decisions need to be made, why don't we just fall on our knees before God and ask him for guidance? And then consult the doctors. And then consult our friends. And then consult those others that we might think have a good opinion. Because maybe they do. Because there is, there is, there is um, safety in a multitude of counselors. But the best counselor we can ever go to is God himself. And we have a direct access to him. So why not use it to, to our advantage? And, and that's what the Lord had, had been working on my hearts with. I, I loved this. This is, not a, this is not a fairy tale. These are real people in a real situation. This was a real king in a real kingdom who made real mistakes and suffered consequences. Now, we're not kings and queens, but we have the ability to make some of the same dumb mistakes in trusting in other things rather than trusting in God. Would that we would just trust him enough to go to him first. And that's really the crux of the message. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for the patience of your people. Thank you for your precious word. I pray that you would help us to be encouraged by it, Lord, to go on from this place tonight. And and Lord, even in the small things in our life, when things occur, they're not a surprise to you. Um, Help us to run to you, to fall on our knees before you in a proper attitude and ask you, the answers. Ask you for the help. Ask you, Father, to show us what we should do. And then uh, let us enjoy your loving arms around us and your support in our lives. We ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week.